like sort of sublime to the ridiculous. Gibraltar. Um, it's uh, a small uh, site, uh, about 1,400 miles south of here. Um, this is it, the Rock of Gibraltar. Um, as you can see, it's a peninsula attached to southern Spain, um, but not part of Spain. Um, slide here, Gibraltar is the small bit poking down on the right hand side there. Um, that, does that work? Oh yeah, this is Gibraltar, that's the border with Spain there. So it's a small, delicate uh, peninsula on the southern part uh, of the Mediterranean. Um, it's British overseas territory. Um, it has its own constitution with 17 MPs, and so heritage is part of the devolved uh, powers that it has. But defence and foreign policy, which includes UNESCO, um, are dealt with by the UK. So we work very closely with Henry, Christopher in the past, uh, about uh, matters to do with UNESCO. I'm putting this up because it's, it's sort of, um, I was struck by the comparison with, with the uh, frontiers of the Roman Empire, this extensive three continents wide um, World Heritage Site. We can do three continents of research collaboration, but it is actually only six square kilometres, Gibraltar, uh, in total. And the World Heritage Site obviously is slightly smaller than that again. Um, it's a large lump of limestone, Jurassic limestone with shale, dolomites and that sort of thing. Sticks up 426 metres above sea level, so it goes up quite vertically. Small number of inhabitants, about the equivalent of the inhabitants of Driffield, something like that. Smaller than Salisbury. Sorry. Um, and it has 32,000 inhabitants. So it's not very big. That has implications for resources, for skills and all the rest of it. Um, most Gibraltarians are bilingual. Uh, Janito is, is the, the dialect, uh, Andalusian Spanish but, uh, and uh, English. Um, mixed population, uh, British, Spanish, Maltese, Genoese, uh, Hebrew, uh, Hindu, Moroccan. <coughs> it's a very mixed place. It's an entrepot on the end, edge of the Mediterranean. Um, most of the settlement is on the west side, which is the Bay of Algeciras side, Bay of Gibraltar side. Not the Mediterranean because that's too steep. It has no natural resources, um, and its economy, uh, which is important in terms of world heritage, 30% of it is based on tourism, 30% uh, on financial services, and then shipping, and that sort of thing is also a very important part uh, of its economy. It's a highly interdependent economy between Gibraltar and local Campo in Spain. There's about 10,000 Spanish workers cross the border every day. Uh, to work in Gibraltar, and uh, there are, that, those figures are correct, 7.6 million tourists a year. Small place, six square meter, six square kilometers, seven million tourists, that works out at 21,000 people per day, every day of the year, in theory. So it's, it's, um, it's an interesting place. Anyway, um, of those, about 10% go to the Upper Rock, which is where the World Heritage Site is. So, um, I just wanted to put things in context, really. Um, small. It's got quite a long history, though, with occupation going back to the Neanderthals 127,000 years ago. Um, there is some evidence for early modern humans, which includes mobile and rock art. Um, but the, there's not very much prehistoric occupation on Gibraltar. Um, between 4,000 and uh, well, 4,000 the Roman Empire. Um, it mostly takes the form of burials, but also offerings in caves, because Gibraltar is strategically positioned um, so that when you're coast hopping around the Mediterranean, it's the last place before you sort of fall off the edge of the world, the pillars of Hercules. Gibraltar is Monscalpe, Jebel Musa is Monzabila in Morocco, the other side. So, um, it's, um, there's, there's not a lot there before, before you get to the uh, occupation by the Moors in 711 when Gibraltar became a strategic, a strategic bridgehead for the conquest of uh, Moorish Spain. Captured by Spain seven centuries later, um, captured by Britain in 1704, Treaty of Utrecht uh, cedes the Rock of Gibraltar to Britain in perpetuity. There's lots of arguments about that. Charles can talk about it at length too. Um, I'm not going to talk any more about it. I just feel I should be in the Brexit thing at the moment. <laughs> anyway, um, so our World Heritage Site. Um, as Becky said, 
This is the UK's latest World Heritage Site, ins inscribed last year. It's on the east side of the rock. Um, it's here, the dark green bit. Uh, it covers 28 hectares, small, delicate, sheer cliffs. Um, it's outlined in red here. Uh, 28 hectares. Its buffer zone is the light green bit here, uh, which is, is protected by the nature legislation, because this is the Upper Rock Nature Reserve. Uh, which does have monkeys. I'll just mention monkeys because I'm sure that's probably what most of you will associate with Gibraltar. They were introduced by the British, um, um, but there are about 400 of them, which is far too many. Most of the settlement is here, in the, and this is the, this is the old town, uh, founded probably in the 12th century. Um, and as you can see, Gibraltar, the, the World Heritage Site, is on the east side, the protected site. Um, slide on the bottom left there shows you the World Heritage Site going up from uh, a view of the viewing platform, former 18th century gun battery, uh, which has just been opened, where you get a, quite a nice view of the site as a whole, going from the sea caves at the bottom, 426 metres to the top of the rock. So, um, the outstanding universal value, it's a testimony to, ne to Neanderthals uh, and early modern human populations. There's 120,000 years worth of occupation, and what has come out of the research project, which has been going on for a substantial amount of time, is a lot of, of new information about the Neanderthals' abilities, cognitive abilities, uh, dress, ornamentation, diet, abilities for hunting, uh, and so on. Um, and it's, as far, it's, it's probably got one of the best sequences from that point of view. So, um, Research collaboration. There's a long history of research in Gibraltar on Neanderthals, but not only on Neanderthals, but also on geology, bone breccias, uh, going back to the 18th century. And because it was a military base, a lot of that is <coughs> the military uh, engineers, surveyors, and that sort of thing who participated in it. Um, Neanderthals, species of Homo, lived in Europe, uh, the Middle East, not in Africa as far as we know. Um, Close ex closest to extinct relatives and so on. Um, but they were here in Gibraltar, sorry, there in Gibraltar, uh, for about 100,000 years, give or take. And we have evidence both for burials. Uh, the first Neanderthal skull was found in Gibraltar in uh, 1848, and a second one, a child, in 1926. <coughs> but Germans beat us to it, because the Germans went the right way to declare their fossil skulls, whereas Gibraltar, merely um, having found it in a quarry, uh, where they were quarrying for the, to, to build their batteries, um, just declared it locally to the Gibraltar Scientific Society. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, first skull was found here. And the first skulls found um, in this area here. Um, this, this is Forbes Quarry. Uh, and then the second skull is found in this area here. This shows, this is looking south with, this is the other pillar of Hercules in Morocco at the background there. See that there? Um, and you can see the sheer eastern side of the rock there and the northern side beaten about by 2,000 kilometres of, of fetch across the Mediterranean. And the slightly gentler western side there. All this is reclamation uh, with, with the um, harbour built in the late 19th, early 20th century there. Um, airfield, uh, for those of you who are interested, is World War II. Um, I, what I haven't mentioned, probably shouldn't mention, is that there are 32 miles of tunnels inside Gibraltar, most of which are World War II. So you think you're standing on a solid piece of limestone, uh, but actually it's got lots of holes in it. But the military history of Gibraltar, is, as people, colleagues will know, is, is, is a very interesting one, uh, and, a, and an entire subject in itself. Okay, World Heritage Site. I'd like to make an announcement here. There will be a prize, the keys to the city of Gibraltar, for those who spot how many times Henry features in this lecture. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there will be an extra prize for how many different coloured pairs of socks he's wearing. <laughs> okay, uh, the site itself is uh, quite challenging to access. Um, it's, um, the sea caves are down a, a very steep cliff, 60 metre cliff. Uh, these are the access steps down, which were repaired. Uh, top photo here shows them cleaning the cliffs, removing the stabilisation and so on. So there's lots of, of, of management challenges to the site, as well as uh, um, <coughs> academic challenges. The main attributes, as I mentioned earlier on, 
are sea caves at the bottom here. They're now sea caves, they weren't at one point. Um, Van Gorham's cave here and Vanguard cave here. Um, that's, that height there is about 60 metres. These are big caves. They are 40 metres high. Uh, and Gorham's cave here extends back about 130 metres. They're quite big things. And they're full of aeolian drift and um, uh, sediment which has come from the caves. Not only that, though, the second part of the outstanding universal value relates to the landscape setting, which comes from information which has been gathered over the last 20 odd years. Okay, um, it gives you a sort of trying to give you an idea of scale there. Um, the best way to, to see the caves is actually from the sea, which is the shot that you get at the bottom there. Um, that's Hannah, the DCOS, who's one of our colleagues. Uh, okay, go away. Um, but it, it gives you an idea of scale. You're standing about 50 yards back from the entrance to the cave there. Um, the cave itself goes off up to the uh, right there. Um, and we take visitors down there, but there are various protection mechanisms like gabions to prevent the storm damage and so on. And they're wearing hats because you get rock falls. So it's quite an exciting place to work sometimes. Come on, you can do it. It doesn't want to play, Becky. Ah, no, 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 okay. Um, the reason I'm talking about all this is, is that the research which underpinned the nomination gives us the information. Um, you've got higher levels of archaeological detail, um, both about you know, the lithics, what they were doing where, the activities. You also have unique um, information like the uh, Neanderthal engraving. It's, it's well sealed within it. It's 39,000 plus years old. It's about that big. It's right at the back of the cave where there's uh, a chamber which goes off. Um, and there is certainly modern human art within that chamber, which you have to crawl into. But what it does, uh, what that Neanderth engraving is about, we don't know. But what it does demonstrate is Neanderthal's abilities to concentrate, to focus, to think, and design. So, um, other information relates to diet, and it relates to Neanderthal's abilities to hunt, to scavenge, uh, all of these are, are abilities which Neanderthals are classically not supposed to have. But they're hunting big raptors, uh, big birds. Uh, they're hunting those and then they are stripping the bones off and they're using the specifically the wing feathers, presumably for ornamentation. But there's also a lot of evidence about diet uh, and that sort of thing. So it's... Um, why am I telling you all about this? Pollen the landscape from hyena droppings. So the, the landscape which we have today is very similar to the landscape which the Neanderthals would have known. The other element is the setting which it sits within. You can see the sea caves at the bottom of the slide there. These are the tectonic, five tectonic units-ish, which go up probably to about five million years ago. Um, and the Pleistocene ones at the bottom with the sea caves. There are lots of raised beds, lots, lots of former sea uh, beds as you go up the rock. Uh, there's lots of evidence for early hominids. So that setting was there when the Neanderthals were there, as was a very large uh, uh, sand dune, which was blown. Um, this, the World Heritage Site is here. It's this. Um, and that's blown from a now submerged uh, sand dune, uh, uh, coastal plain, if you like, because for 80% 80, 80 of the time the Neanderthals were there, the sea level's 80% down. So, we had a very short journey to inscription from applying for the list in 2010, getting on the list in 2011, passing the technical evaluation in 2012, sitting back for 18 months and doing nothing, which wasn't very helpful, uh, and then writing the, the nomination dossier uh, over a period of nine months in 2014. And then we were inscribed in 2015. Some of the comments which came through from the expert panel were to do with uh, all of this stuff, the importance of this sits in your archaeological levels. If you are carrying on digging your archaeological levels, you are going to remove the outstanding universal value. So one of the things that we had to demonstrate was balancing, uh, balancing conservation and that sort of thing, and, and that we weren't being irresponsible. Yes, thank you. So, as I said, we had a quick journey. The quick journey is based on the fact that there was a scientific partnership which had been running by 2011 for 
20 years plus, and involved 43 international institutions. This is a site, um, you've got Vanguard Cave at the top there. These are all Neanderthal levels. They, there's 18 metres of Neanderthal levels there. And the other site is Gorham's Cave. This, this research collaboration, 43 institutions over three continents, it had its origins in um, the British Museum ringing up the tourist board in Gibraltar saying, we'd like to go and dig the caves. Um, that was caught by the curator of the museum who said, uh, we'd like to play at this point. And initially it was a quick fix in and out, but then it then developed into a multidisciplinary project because it was realised by the Gibraltarians that it was a big project, it was important. And although for 10 years there wasn't very much to say, thereafter the publications have been exponential and they've all fed in to the uh, development of the nomination, the development of the, um, the site itself. So research sits at the begin at right central tenet to the management plan, which went in with the nomination dossier. Fostering the gathering is, continues. Um, we had to write framework. Uh, we have a research framework. I'm going to read it, uh, which went in with the nomination dossier. Uh, we have academic questions, uh, which are all asked, all to do with the the, um, the Neanderthals. But the interesting thing about this is that it's, it's, it is very multidisciplinary. It is run by ecologists, this site. It's not run by archaeologists, although there are archaeologists there. It's the research which is done is very much overseen by an international peer group here. You've got the normal management structure. Um, and that international group includes people from the UK, uh, Jeff Bailey, uh, from Spain, uh, two World Heritage Sites, from Israel, which is the only other Neanderthal World Heritage Site, and also Minja Yang, who used to be the Deputy Director. So there's quite a lot of scrutiny which looks after they approve um, what we do, how we do it. They've approved our balance between conservation and excavation. I mentioned that we know so far that you have 18 metres worth of archaeological deposits um, on the site. Um, on the basis of this here, setting ourselves targets, it would take 5,000 years to excavate Gorham's Cave. So you then get a multidisciplinary, multi-generational project, um, which um, has, has worked for the last 20 years and will continue to work. So partners helped develop the nomination. They supported the nomination. You've got uh, the Spanish geologists and geomorphologists, colleagues from the UK there as well. That's what the composition of the research partnership looks like. You've got all over the world, but the principal partners are Gibraltar, UK, and Spain. They bring an awful lot of skills, scientific interests, as you can imagine. And it's important because it's not a site which is, is straightforward. You do need caving skills. You do need reconstruction skills. These are models of the Gibraltarian uh, skulls uh, by the Dutch Kennis brothers, who are, if you ever want to get them to do any of your Scottish sites, they are the most amazing pair of twin brothers uh, who never stop talking, but they are utterly obsessed with Neanderthal. Uh, so they're, they're forensically very accurate, and these are now in the Gibraltar Museum. Um, pass over that. There's a core team. There's a, uh, about a dozen on the research team, uh, again, you've got multinational, uh, multidisciplinary team, and it's been a project. I, mean, I asked the director what, why he started it, and he just said, well, "It's a natural thing to do. You know, we couldn't cope. We are a small place. We have a small number of people, but we have all these friends, these networks. And as you build those networks, you get more people. You get unexpected uh, enrichment of research. He's an ecologist, an evo evolutionary ecologist, studies birds. But the, the discoveries in the caves about how and what the Neanderthals were eating actually prompted him to go off and do more research in northern Spain about vultures, about raptors. So it's having a, a, a very much a spin-off. And these are all producing papers on birds, the diet, uh, behaviour, ornamentation and so on. So it's some um, from his point of view, there was, just, there was just no option. They could have carried on doing it. But it basically 
there wouldn't have been a nomination without that research. It supported the nomination, and it continues to support the nomination. There are, of course, negatives, as some of them are, are, are outlined there. Um, those are the uh, negatives. It's my interpretation of what Clive said, herding cats uh, and egos. There are disappointments when people don't deliver. But fundamentally, um, the research program that was there enabled us to be, even think about becoming a World Heritage Site, apply for it, get it, and then continue to feed it uh, into the academic press, into the management, into the interpretation. And that slide sort of sums it up, really. Um, sums up the weather, too, come to that. Um, but I think that the, 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 the other thing which we just never forget is although that you get these disappointments, it's actually quite fun. Thank you.